So this may be one of those videos where I go rambling off again, but you know, you never would have learned how to walk if you didn't get tired of falling over in your crib. Now you think about it, right? That was a major hurdle you had to cover. You had this giant, huge head and a tiny little body and tiny little feet and no motor skills. But you, you were tired of laying there and you wanted to get up and move like everybody else was. And you had no concept of the language. You know, you maybe you knew mommy, right? Daddy, that sort of stuff, right? Poopy. But you didn't have a real grasp of the language or anything. So you couldn't, you couldn't understand things like negativity or, or, you know, people telling you how it should be done. You had to figure this out on your own. And you worked at it and it was tough. So at first, you know, you stood up. You tried to stand, you'd fall over. You tried to stand, you'd fall over. Then finally you grab the rail of the crib and boom, you're standing. You let go, you fall over. It's a process. You keep going and going until eventually you've, you've mustered all of your energy and your strength and your focus and you actually you're able to let go of the crib and stand there on your own. That's your first step. And nobody told you this can't be done. In fact, they're encouraging you. They're walk to me, walk to me. And you do, you take that first step, you try to take that first step and boom, you fall right over on your face, right? But you're still not deterred by negativity. You're still like, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna get this done. And you do it. And today, look at you, you walk like a champion, right? All started with that first effort. And all started with your own motivation, with nobody outside telling you, it's too hard, you can't do it, it can't be done, you're wasting your time. No, you just get up and you do it. But it's that adversity, that, that conquering of adversity, because you got tired of laying there. You're bored, you have to move forward, you have to make action in your life. That's what drove you to take those steps, take those chances, fall over, hurt yourself, whatever it was, you cry a few minutes, you get up, and you're right back at it. You achieved success. This is how the car thing is. This is how all human learning is like that. All progress comes through adversity. You know, if you go back to the, to the cave days, right? We needed caves because we're pretty fragile as far as like animals go. We needed shelter. You know, we don't have fur. We don't have that extra layer of fat, you know, and all the other stuff that other animals do. So we needed shelter. We needed fire. We don't have big fangs and claws and we can't like run like pumas. So you know, we needed to develop tools to go out and hunt and, and do all the things we had to do. All progress comes through conquering adversity. So what does this have to do with cars? Right? Well, it, actually, it has everything to do with cars. Because there, there are like two schools, there are two types of car people. There are some people who just love the finished product. All they care about is, what is this thing? And... They're really, they're ego driven for the most part. I'm not putting them down because there've been many times in my life where I've had a car and I was like, yes, this is my car. You know, and I enjoyed the finished product. But much more than that, I enjoy the challenge. I like, I like working with things that shouldn't work. I like doing things that shouldn't be done. Well, I mean, not, not, in, a, not in a negative way, but in other words, you know, oh, that can't be done. That's too hard or that won't work. I love that. That's the challenge that, that, that motivates me to actually get up and do something. I'm always, I'm 60 years old and I'm still learning. I'm still, every day I try to learn, I try to pick up new knowledge. I'm always researching, I'm always taking things apart, I'm always dissecting them, I'm always tweaking them and, and twisting them and pushing them as far as I go to find out what the breaking point is. Because that's a big part of it. You don't really understand a, an item until you break it. You know, and that's, that's one of the things about Cars, doing the car thing can be very expensive. And so to push stuff to where it breaks and do it with expensive stuff, you gotta be rich. Which is one of the reasons why I really enjoy working with the basics. I like working with this, the slant sixes or the 318s or the, the orphan stuff that like, yeah, push it, break it, who cares? You know, you get another one right down the street, not a big deal. But it's, that's what motivates me. And I'm, I'm sure if you're a regular viewer on this channel, you feel the same way. You know, you're, you're interested in the same things that I am. Let's see what we can make out of this. Let's see what we can do. Let's polish the turd. So what am I getting at? Where am I going with this? The last video we posted, we fixed the freeze cracks on this 361. So we did, this is the side that we showed and right afterwards, we did this one. And 
there were a lot of comments, a very active comment section on it. Our comments, our comment section are, are usually pretty active. But this particular one caught my attention because there were so many people who were throwing their actual experiences with similar situations into the comments. And the, the, the thing that struck me was that there were completely divergent schools of thought on how something like this should be done. And even though they were coming from opposite ends of the spectrum, they were all right. Everybody, all of these, these, these methods were right, even though they were contradictory. All right, so the first school of thought was, for lack of a better word, the hack backyard way to do this. And I'm not saying that in a negative way. I'm saying this is like what you would do is just like, I don't care about this thing. I just want to get it down the road, right? Just. And this was, well, it's just a free, it only f cracked because it froze. If it doesn't freeze again, it's not going to crack. So clean it out real good, fill it with epoxy, and send it down the road. It'll be fine. You know what? I know you're 100% right because I've done that. Anybody who's been around for any amount of time has come across a similar situation where you've got a cracked casting for whatever reason, and you're just like, you know what? It's not worth taking apart. It's not worth getting involved in all that stuff. Let me just try to shove some epoxy in there and see what happens. So in a situation like this, a freeze-cracked block, you clean it out really good with brake clean. You heat it with a torch. You know, you get it just hot so it expands a little bit. You take the epoxy, your JB Weld, whatever epoxy you're going to use, and you jam it into the crack. You keep working it into the crack. And then you build it up and you make a nice layer. And then you go away and you let it sit and cure for a day. And when you're done, it's fixed. Because you shove it into the crack as it cures, it grabs the block so that it won't get pushed out under pressure. And it's as good as new. It will, it will motor down the road for years to come like there was never a problem. If you do it right. If you, if you don't do it right, it's not going to work. But that's besides the point. Now, I didn't want to do it that way because, A, I was trying to come up with something a little more permanent, and B, I saw this as a chance to experiment, as a chance to learn, right? Here's my adversity, and here's my opportunity on something that really has no value. Let's see what happens. Let's push it and, and see if we can, we can confirm a theory develop a new skill. So that's what I did. That's why I welded it. All right, so let's move on to the, to the next one. The next school of thought, and there were a lot of them, were guys who were professional welders who work with cast iron all the time. And they were all pretty unanimous in that, okay, you have to use this type, well, okay, they all use different, different methods, but all along the same lines. This type of welder with this type of amperage, this type of rod, like a nickel rod, or and then it's got to, the block has got to be heated, and it's got to be, you know, you, you, you got to weld it while you keep maintaining heat around the block, and then you let it cool, and then it has to cool very slowly, reach room temperature, and, and all that, and it'll be good to go. <sighs> yes, I know, that is the right way to fix a block. I have never done it myself. But I have had it done. Years ago, I had a head fixed by a guy, I believe his name was Al Mathon, High Speed Salvage, and they used to weld cast iron. And the, the piece that I needed welded was rare and valuable, so it was absolutely worth investing the money that it cost to do it. And it was a lot of money back then, even back then. But this is a throwaway. This is, a, a, on its best day, it's a $50 block. It's a 361 Chrysler. Nobody on earth wants a 361 Chrysler. If I tried this and I broke, it was already scrap. So if I tried it and I broke it, well, all I have is more scrap, but another learning experience. You learn through adversity. So if I weld it and it cracks, well, now I'll dissect it and figure out why it cracked. Where did I go wrong? And I'll get to that in a couple of minutes also. Because I have tried to weld these things before in a similar fashion. And they have cracked. And I learned from those mistakes. And that's why I did it the way I did it. The third school of thought, there were a bunch of guys in there that were like, I did exactly what you did. I, I, I welded little sections at a time. I let it cool off. I peened it with a hammer to get the stresses out of it. And just kept going a little bit of time, a little bit of time, a little bit of time. And it, that's it. It was done. Fixed. Good to go. <laughs> it worked, right? 
You took the chances. You know it's not supposed to be done that way. You know you're probably going to fail. You go into it knowing you're probably going to fail. But, you know, let's try this method to see what happens. And that's what we did here. And it did work for us. The fourth, I don't even want to, I don't even know I'm bringing these guys up, but there was a fourth school of thought was that it'll never work. You can't weld cast iron. Throw it away. It's scrap. <sighs> Come on, right? Just total negativity. Like, why do you even bother getting out of bed in the morning? There were, in, along those lines, there were people that were like, it's going to crack as soon as it gets cold. No, it won't. It'll never get cold enough to freeze again, right? I'm, I'll keep antifreeze in it. I'll keep it so that it doesn't freeze crack again. The block will never distort to that point that it'll, it'll crack. Then you have the other guys. It'll crack as soon as it gets hot. No. It's, and I said, you have to use discernment. It's on the outside of the block. It's on the coolest part of the block. It's the last place of the block that gets hot, and it's very gradual, and it's the first place on the block to cool off, and that's very gradual. If this thing gets hot enough to crack that weld there on the outside of the block, boy, I got much bigger fish to fry, because then it literally melted everything inside the engine. So <laughs> cracking this thing again is like, that, that's not even on a radar. Not a problem. But like I said, it's a matter of adversity. It's a matter of conquering adversity and building your skill set. And every, every skill that you pick up will transfer to something else. You know, the knowledge that you get troubleshooting, let's just say, an ignition problem. Somewhere down the road, you'll have to fix a dishwasher or whatever it happens to be. And those connections in your brain, the, the, the method of troubleshooting and, and, and following wires and checking circuits, it'll all transfer. So you're always building a skill set, and that skill set is always expanding. It's always, it's always, and you apply it to different things as you go through life. And this is what makes you a better, more proficient human. It makes, it makes your journey through life just that much smoother and that much more efficient, you know, that much more profitable. So, like I said, this was a scrap block. As far as I was concerned, if it was a failure, Fine. Now I, I know I tried this way and it failed. In the past, I have tried welding these things. I've had numerous blocks. This is actually a very common problem with these blocks. Now, in the past when I've welded these, I've had them crack when I finished welding. I did the first couple I, I tried with oxyacetylene right, and a steel rod, and that didn't work. You know, you would get halfway through the crack, because once you start with oxyacetylene, you can't stop, because it takes a long time for this to get hot, the, like the whole area around it has to get hot before it will start to absorb heat and actually be able to weld. So once you start with oxyacetylene, well, you got to go all the way, right, in one shot. And by that time, there's so much heat here, and it hasn't radiated to the outer portions yet, that as soon as it starts to cool off, it'll crack, it just, it'll shatter. It cracks will run off in all different directions. So I knew that that wasn't gonna work. I tried it once before uh, with, with a flux core welder, but I, like, like with the oxyacetylene, I went in one shot. And as I went across, I got about three quarters of the way across, and as I was welding it, it cracked. It went off like this. So I says, all right, what I have to do with this now is well, okay, the first, my first choice would have been, was to pin it, right? And the pinning is where you drill a series of holes in the casting. You drill a hole, you thread a bolt into it, tighten it down, groin the head of the bolt off. Then you drill another overlapping hole next to it. So you're just into, just into that other bolt, and you do the same thing. You tap it, and you thread a bolt into it, tighten it down, grind the head off. And you just keep going until you've covered the whole crack. That's, a, that's how I used to fix locomotives back in the, the 1800s. It works. I've done it and it works. But in this particular case, it wouldn't work. Because when I looked through the core plug, I had this plug out, I could see that this crack ran exactly along the floor of the water jacket. So this is thick and this is thin. So I would be drilling into half thick, half thin. If I was even able to get a straight hole in there and tap it straight, as I tighten the bolt down, the bolt is going to cock over and create all kinds of stresses. So pinning was not an option on this particular thing. But using my prior failures and knowing how the block is a heat sink, well, what I did was 
I welded very short sections and didn't allow the block to get hot. I welded this much and stopped. Now, the weld is still relatively malleable. It's hot. The block is cold. So instead of the weld pulling the block, the block pulls the weld before it has a chance to crack. So the block is stress relieving the weld as you go along. So you go this far, let it sit, let it get completely cold. And then go this far, let it sit, let it get completely cold. Go this far, let it sit, let it get completely cold. And you keep going until you've gone all the way through. And if you look at the heat affected zone around the weld, well, the paint is only damaged a quarter of an inch, a half inch or so around the weld. There was no great, you know, distortion to the side of this block. This part right here never even got warm. This never even got warm. This is a completely valid way of fixing this. And also, I had a couple of people also comment that like, oh, you got no penetration. You know, there's no way you got penetration on that. No, I, I was welding it. I could see as I'm welding it that I had the pool. And the pool, I was working the pool from one side to the other and filling in that bottom piece right there. I was going slowly from one side to the other. It absolutely got penetration. So I'm not worried about that. That thing is fixed. It was a challenge. It was a challenge. The stakes were very low. But it was a victory. You see what I'm saying? It was a victory because I did what's not supposed to be done. I, and it's not like I'm not saying, oh, I'm great because I did better. I know better than the guys who weld cast iron. I know better than... No, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that in this case, I used my discernment. I used my experience. And I applied them to this job and had a success. And I had that success... I was only able to have that success because I have had failures with it in the past. The moral of the story is, don't be afraid to fail, right? That's what it's all about. That's where you learn. Embrace the failure. Obviously, if you've got a huge investment in the part, the component, the system that you're working with, obviously, if you've got a huge investment in a thing, well then, don't, don't experiment with it. Fix it the right way, do it the right way. If you've got something that's extremely rare, it's, ext it's not replaceable. No, in a million years, don't even think about attempting this, okay? But if you're working like we do here, and you're working with parts that are just generally worthless, they're easy to find, they don't have big value, you know, and that's, just, that's why I love working with slant sixes and 318s and stuff like that, because I can break them. I can push them and try to do things with them that they're not supposed to do, and I can break them, and it's cool. I learned, okay, you can't do that because this is the failure point. Great, bring on another one. Let's do it again. And that's what I'm going to do with this 361. This is going to be a mule engine, and we're going to do all sorts of stuff to it and push it and see what breaks or see how it breaks or see what the limits are. Well, among other things, there's lots of stuff, lots of theories and stuff I want to test with this engine. But that's it, guys. Embrace the failure, right? It's how you learn. It's how you get ahead. And enjoy it. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the learning. Because that is what it's really all about. I hope you got something out of that. I'll see you tomorrow.